Good morning, everyone. I'm Natalia Kapitnik, Director of Communications at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's discussion. We are very excited to launch this special series of our Chain Reaction podcast. Over the next few months, the Continent Series will explore how the war in Ukraine is changing Europe's politics and security. Just a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and will be available on our website, www.fpri.org, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and also here on Twitter. So with that, we'll get started, and I'll turn it over to Aaron. All right. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome to the continent. Um, I'm Aaron. I'm a fellow with FPRI's Eurasia program. And over the years, uh, I have focused on Russia's politics, economy, security, and the intersection of the three. This podcast, however, is not about Russia. Uh, just before Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine, uh, I was talking with my friend and colleague Chris Miller, who happens to head FPRI's Eurasia program, and we agreed that beyond the rather obvious implications of a war for both Russia and Ukraine, such a war might also have a tremendous impact in Europe, uh, its politics, security considerations, maybe even how it sees its place in the world. So that's what the continent will be focusing on. In the coming weeks, I'll be visiting, that's in quotations, uh, a variety of countries and speaking to regional specialists, learning about how Ukraine is impacting uh, their countries of focus. I want to emphasize the learning here. Um, Civilization is next to Western Europe, not in it. So I'm going to be asking questions, hopefully learning a bunch. I hope you'll stick around and learn with me. Um, a quick technical note, uh, we'll be doing this podcast, um, as Natalia mentioned, as a mix of Twitter spaces and traditional recordings. Both will be uploaded to FPRI's Chain Reaction podcast, available just about everywhere you can find podcasts. Now, before we dive into today's episode, um, I just want to thank FPRI for their continued support of this project. So let's uh, zoom in and focus on the kind of critical subject of the day, Germany. At least from my vantage points, Germany has seen some of the most radical changes in its politics in recent months which is why we're starting there. Um, today's title is a play on words, and as all puns go, they're always better when you have to explain in detail. So let me explain. Um, it's a play on the word uh, Bundeswehr in German, which is the name of Germany's armed forces. But I'm asking Bundeswehr. Where does Germany and its military stand in light of everything that's... Uh, what is the latest on the kind of political conjuncture in Germany? Hysterical, right? But now I'm really excited to uh, host our guest today. Uh, joining us are doctors Jana Pulierin and Marcel Dursis. Let's start by having them introduce themselves, and because we can't see each other, um, I will call them. Yana, if you could start, if you could share um, your affiliation and research interests. Thanks, Aaron, for having me. Um, my name is uh, Jana Pulierin. Um, I'm a senior policy fellow with the European Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm heading ECFR's Berlin office. Um, my research interests include uh, European and German foreign security and defense policy um, more broadly, um, but also specifically, I'm interested in NATO and the transatlantic uh, relationship. Yeah, I've worked uh, on all things uh, related to the EU previously. Um, I have been working in the Bundestag. I have been working at Bonn University. So my background is in academia, uh, in, in parliament. Uh, but now I'm a think tanker at CFO since January 2020. And before that, I have been heading um, the Europe program of the German Council on Foreign Relations. And I'm very happy to be here and to talk all things uh, related to yeah, our latest uh, Zeitenwende, uh, turning point in history that uh, we just declared, or that our chancellor just declared, and looking forward to the conversation. Great to have you. Uh, Marcel, over to you. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Marcel. I'm a political scientist, and I'm a non-resident fellow at the Institute for Security Policy at the University of Kiel. Um, like I said, my background is in academia. Uh, to begin with, I didn't really look at German foreign policy, uh, and I wrote my PhD about military coups, which is a little bit different. But over the years, I've gotten more involved in foreign policy, and I guess it's quite difficult to escape that, you know, uh, if you are German and you're interested in, pol in policy more generally. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to talk about this topic. I think it's really important, and I think this is an interesting format. Uh, great to have both of you. So uh, I want to turn to our first topic here, and Yana said the word. So one of the words I've learned recently, um, and I'm a huge language nerd, so this was exciting, is Zeitenwende. It's this idea of uh, a shift in eras, a kind of, uh, kind of paradigm shift. A fun fact for other fellow language nerds, uh, Zeitenwende like Venda, is the same root as like a winding road in German. So there's your fun fact of the day. But I wanted to ask, and I was talking to Marcel a little bit about this, or at least uh, messaging back and forth, how big a deal is this shift in German politics and public opinion? Does this have 
a parallel. Um, what are we seeing as far as the shift? Can we talk through kind of the, the narrative? What has changed what you're seeing? And we'll start with Marcel here. From my point of view, it's a, it's a massive shift. You know, I'm definitely not old enough to have seen a bigger shift yet in German politics. So there might have been one, but uh, not, not one that I can remember. You know, I, I think what we're looking at really is uh, almost a 180 uh, in many aspects of German foreign policy and, you know, the span of just a couple of weeks. So even though from abroad it might look too slow um, and, you know, people are accusing Berlin of dithering, which in many ways it is, from within Germany, you know, it's, it's, it's happening at great speed. Uh, and I think that creates a, a huge mismatch also between perceptions from within Germany and outside of it. John, any thoughts on, on, any thoughts on the matter? I'm not sure how big our Zeitenwende is going to be. Um, I, I agree with Marcel um, that some kind of revolutionary uh, decisions have been made in a rather short amount of time. But then again, so far, uh, it's just one speech and uh, yeah, some decisions, right? It's not what, um, what I think is needed, kind of a long term shift of German security and defense uh, policy of our approach towards Russia, of our approach towards dealing with um, autocracies, of revising this idea of kind of change through trade, wandel durch handel. I think we, we see a promising um, beginning, um, but already kind of some uh, worrying signals that um, the trend <laughs> might be might be strolling. And I certainly can remember, I'm, I'm then Marcel, I guess, but I can remember um, the debates we had during the Kosovo War when it was about a red-green uh, coalition government um, kind of joining a war. That was a big thing um, that were that was really highly contested and that was uh, for the Green Party, I think, an epochal change as well. Now we see another one and certainly, I mean, the, the, the war is different and I think this one is, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't compare wars, but... Uh, of course, this is the first kind of full scale war where kind of battle tanks roll over uh, borders um, kind of and, and, and having a nuclear power uh, engaged. But uh, so I, I, I think we, we have been uh, at a point where we have been debating fundamental shifts in German security and defense policy already after Kosovo, where many of the things that we are debating now, we already debated um, and then we stopped debating them. And that's why I'm maybe more cautious and. I hope that we are um, really seeing um, a, a reversal of many things that we have, I think, done wrong. But I'm also a bit skeptical how big the shift will be in the, in the very end. No, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, that's totally fair, right? And it also depends on whether you're looking at rhetoric or whether you're actually looking at, you know, concrete policy uh, changes, right? Um, obviously, you know, the speech that Schultz gave on the side of the end was, I, I thought, very strong. You know, I thought, oh, my God. This could, actually go, this could actually go well for a change. It's like a yeah. whole, whole, whole 10 minutes of, you know, optimism. Uh, and then obviously the, the, the follow-up was, was much weaker. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to hype it too much. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, it sort of depends on the day for me. You know, sometimes I think, oh, my God, so much has improved. You know, we've come such a long way. Uh, and then, you know, if you ask me on another day, I'm like, oh my God, this is so slow. You know, you can already see the setbacks. We should be doing so much more. So I guess it really depends on, on how you look at it, right? Like, do you want to grade Germany on a curve um, and, you know, compare Germany's current rhetoric and current policy to the way that German policy and rhetoric used to be? You know, if that's the case, then we're looking at a pretty big shift. Or do you compare it to something that uh, could be seen as a sensible foreign policy? And if, if that's the case, then, you know, we're still quite far removed from it, I'd argue. I think uh, it's just a good start. So Zeitenwende, the speech and everything that was declared so far is a good start. But I think it now needs to be filled with life. It needs to be continued. And we, we cannot afford to lose steam. So I want to ask, I want to go over just some of the, for, for the audience here, some of the kind of the kind of narrative, like what actually happened in the speech. But another question first that I wanted to ask, just because of my vantage points here in D.C., um, there's lots of conversation. And I'll go to happy hours after work and hear conversation about the latest news in Ukraine. And that is, I would say, not indicative of how regular people are, are thinking about this, if they're thinking about it at all. So wanted to ask um, folks who, you know, you're in Germany, is the war in Ukraine, what kinds of traction um, is this getting in German society? Is this something that you know, people would talk about with their cab driver or you know, Germany's defender, if not the you know specifics of the policy. Hey, um, we need to think about this. Is that is that getting traction in society in your view? Maybe I can start briefly. I think um, what is really new for Germans, for the society more broadly, is that for the first time, actually lifetime, um, in my adult lifetime, is that uh, people feel threatened. Um, that started immediately after the war in Germany. 
unlike in the United States, not many people have seen the war coming. Um, our government um, has been telling people um, that this is not very likely. Um, and so I think it was actually a tremendous shock um, when the war started. Um, and so because from a German perspective, um, I think we many people here were really convinced that we have left all this behind, kind of that um, territorial confrontation of that size is a thing of the past and would happen in all kinds of places, but certainly not in Europe and certainly not two flight hours away from Berlin. So people felt threatened for the first time. And it, it is also, a, oh, it was a dramatic shift in public opinion, whereas um, there was not a lot of interest in all things foreign policy related, which you saw perfectly during the last um, general election campaign, where this was just a non-issue. Uh, foreign policy, security, defense, people barely talked about it and weren't interested. Now, uh, my friends who are not um, very much interested generally in international politics are very worried, concerned, and they talk about it. Um, that has um, advantages and disadvantages because also, um, yeah, actually a lot of people lately are very afraid of, uh, I don't know, a further escalation of the war. And, and, and yeah, people are aware all of a sudden that there are Russian nuclear weapons stationed like uh, not that far away from Germany and that uh, an Iskander missile from Kaliningrad could hit Berlin in under five minutes. And that is new. That puts it in pretty stark perspective. Uh, Marcel, any uh, thoughts or comments from your end here? Yeah, I've had a similar experience to Jana, I think. Um, you know, people were reaching out to me, you know, asking me whether we're going to get nuked. Uh, you know, that sort of thing it didn't really happen before I had, um, which, I mean, I guess is good. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that fear is key here. Um, you know, a lot of people are generally really, really worried. Uh, they are afraid, um, you know, because like Jana said, they just haven't really thought about war. You know, we've been really comfortable. You know, Germans have been able to feel very safe for multiple decades. Uh, so I think this is just new to them. Uh, and you see that in, you know, sort of play out in, in the debates that are being had in Germany, not just in politics, but also in journalism and in the talk shows and so forth. Right. So you've got more people involved in the debate. Um, and that leads to some, you know, interesting uh, debates. Perhaps that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So one is a follow up. So we talked about the Schultz's Titan Venda speech. Can we talk through what concretely he and what what that kind of the, the details of this speech? Um, Marcel, can I ask you about that a little bit? Yeah, that's a good way. Yeah, how do I structure it? I guess um, essentially the, the big theme, I suppose, was that, you know, Germany is going to take security more seriously. Uh, and then uh, there were multiple parts to this, I'd say. So, you know, one was that Germany is going to increase military spending quite drastically. So you've got uh, you know, sort of a long-term defense spending increase, perhaps, but then you've also got, you know, the, the, the famous billions uh, that are going to come in a... God, how do you say this in uh, English, Jana? Do you know? Sondervermögen? I always called it special fund for the Bundeswehr, <laughs> but I, yeah, that doesn't yeah, mean that's it. good. <laughs> okay, so, there's, so, you know, aside from sort of long-term uh, increases in defense spending, there's going to be a special fund for the Bundeswehr, uh, you know, to sort of get us to a respectable baseline, uh, supposedly, um, where you have a functioning military uh, again, essentially. Uh, so that, that was sort of like the main headline. And then there were also a couple of uh, smaller things that have been, uh, debated in Germany for the longest time. So one of the examples was armed drones. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether you, you're you aware of it, but Germany has had a debate about armed drones for multiple decades, I guess, at this point, you know, well over 10 years at least. Uh, you know, while all kinds of other countries have been getting armed drones, in Germany people have been saying that arms shouldn't be, uh, that drones shouldn't be armed uh, because it's evil, uh, you know, sort of the, the weapon itself is evil and that's why Germany shouldn't have it. Uh, so that sort of thing was also mentioned in Scholz's speech. So, yeah, I guess the, the big line is, you know, Germany is going to take the security more seriously, spend more on defense, require new weapon systems. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of the headline, I'd say. One can thing. I, can I... Yeah, please, absolutely. No, because I think um, one thing is really important, um, looking at what Scholz has said during um, the speech. Um, the speech was written in the first days of the war, basically, yeah, three days after the war started. And all observers, at least here in Germany, still assumed a quick victory for Russia. So uh, the speech was not primarily announcing about announcing kind of a long term plan, detailed plan about the future of German foreign security and defense policy. But it was actually a quick reaction to a scenario uh, of Russia possibly taking all of Ukraine. Um, 
and then basically justifying the 100 billion for uh, defense and kind of the need for Germany to to to, to move um, yeah uh, on defense um, and and to do things that were um, prior to to the start of the war unthinkable. Um, what is also important is, I think, to understand that Olaf Scholz had no intention to do a revolution in Germany's security and defense policy. He campaigned as Angela Merkel in a suit. Um, he was elected to be Angela Merkel in a suit. Um, he had ambitious um, ideas for changing kind of Germany's domestic policy, but foreign policy was really supposed to be all about continuity. And then the war happened and then there was this shock and actually, yeah, the assumption that the Russians would win this quickly. And then um, in a reaction to this, Scholz announced um, all, all the things that Marcel um, has just said, but also in addition um, that Germany needs to contribute to strengthening uh, NATO's eastern flank uh, significantly and um, the kind of that Germany would now the taboo to send arms to Ukraine because prior to, to this war, I mean, there were exceptions when we sent weapons to the Peshmerga in uh, 2014, but uh, it is it was considered a taboo to send weapons um, into countries that, that, that were in a war, in an armed conflict. So it was about arms deliveries to Ukraine. It was about uh, far-reaching sanctions against Russia. It was about strengthening NATO's eastern flank. It was about the Sondervermögen, the special fund, and about the 2%. And later, the 2% and the Sondervermögen merged. And it was uh, not to forget about energy um, dependence on Russia to reduce it. So there were some announcements about LNG terminals and yeah, how to, to make Germany more energy independent from Russia. So the special fund, I'm not going to try to pronounce the word in German. <laughs> I, I, I just for some math, because I was struck by this. I think uh, working a lot in you know, my, my day job with, with data, people struggle to understand like what big numbers actually mean. So it's 100 billion euro. And doing that, putting that in concrete terms, if Germany were to spend all of that on tanks, which is not going to, but if it were, um, it would be about 6,000 tanks. That is a lot. Now, of course, won't be all spent on that, but just for, for scale. Um, I wanted to ask, since we're talking about um, Schultz and his positioning and, and his speech, um, I want to ask about how the kind of various political parties in, German, uh, in Germany, you know, in the coalition, outside of the coalition, have positioned themselves around this crisis. And there's something really interesting that I couldn't help but notice as an American that was very glaring to me. So our Green Party here um, has been accused literally of being a Russian cutout. You know, Jill Stein visited Moscow um, before the 2016 election, it um, is viewed as, you know, accurately or inaccurately, very soft on Russia. In a German context, and this is what is seems crazy to me, the Green Party seems to be the most hawkish party towards Russia in the entire political arena. So can you talk about that and explain to me like how that's possible? What's that? Marcel, do you start? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the Greens are, uh, yeah, they're, they're quite, um, you know, I always, I'm, I'm never really quite sure whether hawkish is the right word, because um, I suppose, you know, in the American, hawk, you know, context, hawkish basically means that, you know, you sort of like rarely find a war that, that you don't want to get involved in, right? So I would say that in the German context, um, you know, hawkish is perhaps not quite accurate, but it is accurate to say that the Greens have probably had the toughest position, not just on, on Russia, perhaps, but perhaps also on China. I think, in their case, it's not so much about, you know, I don't know, bringing democracy to far-flung places or, you know, necessarily advancing the German national interest. But, uh, you know, they very much want a bigger role for human rights and values in, in foreign policy. Uh, and they've been critiquing the previous German policy uh, very heavily. And that previous German policy, of course, was essentially a maximization of short-term economic interest. And, and they want to move beyond that. So... You know, in that sense, they did want to take a tougher line on Russia, uh, but not so much when it came to military power, because the Greens have traditionally been quite skeptical of uh, the utility of force in international relations. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, they're pacifists or that necessarily they have been pacifists, because, you know, they have agreed to some bonus fair missions uh, in, in the past, of course. Uh, but that is, I would say, you know, different from the American context, where hawkish at least I associate with, with military power, essentially. What is super interesting about the Green Party is that basically they have warned for a long time um, 
against this idea uh, to get so energy dependent on Russia. They have been uh, opposing Nord Stream 2 yeah, forever, basically. And now, um, especially um, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, where Germany has viewed with quite some suspicion um, these days, the Greens actually um, have a much better reputation because they have been very critical with the Russian government. They have been uh, looking at um, what happens to, to civil society in Russia, how it is crashed, basically, and how yeah, how the, how the country becomes basically uh, a dictatorship. Uh, and, and the Greens were very aware of all of this, whereas uh, in the CDU and especially in the SPD, people were very, very ready to close their eyes and, and yeah, to, to say that, no, no, uh, we are not overly dependent on Russia. That's all manageable and there isn't a problem. Russia is a reliable, reliable energy supplier. And yeah, so the Green Party uh, got it right um, a long time ago. So yeah. a question about that. Oh, please go, Marcel. No, I was just going to say, and the, like one thing that I guess makes it easier for them is that um, they are less involved in creating this mess in the first place. Right? Yeah. So uh, you know, it's always a little bit funny when like the CDU goes after the Social Democrats for like having messed up, or and then the Social Democrats go after the CDU for having messed up because they've all messed up. You know, <laughs> like they they all screwed up big time. And you know, like I said, the Greens haven't gotten everything right, particularly when it comes to you know military force, perhaps, but they got it more right than the others. And because they didn't make the decisions that made Germany dependent on Russian energy, for example, it's now easier for them to take a harder line than, than it would be for Social Democrats, for example, because the same people that screwed up are still in power, basically. So I guess two follow-up questions there that I'm, I'm curious about. Um, one of the things I've read about this kind of change in German politics, or, or rather the difference between parties, is just the age of the leadership, where it seems to me, or was written that, Green Party leadership is younger, kind of from a fundamentally different generation. Do you view that as a reasonable argument or like a credible explanation of the difference in policy between the parties? I'm a bit doubtful, you know, um, because we, you know, there was recently um, an essay published by Jürgen Habermas, basically the intellectual pope uh, in Germany. And he basically said that the generation of Annalena Baerbock, our foreign minister, um, is not... Um, kind of is too young to understand what war really means and is kind of approaching things uh, not um, kind of from a rational uh, point of view but with too many emotions so I'm, I'm a bit allergic against this um, generational um, stance because there are actually many young politicians also at, at least in the SPD the, the new party had or one of the two party heads last thing but he's also I think he's 44 um, so just four years older than Annalena Baerbock or three years older and Christian Lindner from the FDP is also about that age so but but um so i wouldn't uh, make it about age i think for the greens it it was and and also for the liberals i think they 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 always emphasized um also kind of democracy uh, in, in the struggle, democracy versus autocracy. I think uh, Marcel alluded to that uh, previously. So that was always something that was more important um, for the smaller parties than for the big parties. But I don't really know if it's a generational thing. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just allergic because I think this characterization of uh, generation Annalena Baer is kind of, those are the kind of the, the people, the young uh, kind of emotional women. I, 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 I found that completely misplaced. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's this place that it's uh, not a characterization that's fair by any stretch. Marcel, over to you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I don't really think it's a generational a generational thing. Like I said, I, I think some of it is structural, you know, who's in power, who's not in power, uh, what's their history. Um, and of course, you have, you know, young and old people agreeing, you know, with, with either position, right, when it comes to things like, you know, delivery of arms and so forth. So uh, I'm not really sure that age is the uh, determining factor here. But what is interesting, uh, just because I remember this when I was analyzing the German election result, is that the, the younger generation in Germany, so people under 40, um, were much more likely to vote for either uh, the Greens or the, little, the smaller parties with kind of this clear uh, value compass um, and kind of yeah, new ideas about modernizing Germany, also domestic. So maybe there is something to it when it comes to to, to voters, um, younger people more attracted by by the by the smaller parties. But I think also because they stood for something um, different than the Grand Coalition, and I think people just wanted change in Germany. I mean, change that didn't hurt too much, but still, younger people wanted to see something different. You know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, the question is though, sort of like, what did they really vote for, right? Yeah. Um, like I was looking at the um, uh, the campaign posters of the Greens, for example, uh, during the last election, which of course isn't that long ago, 
And when it came to arms deliveries, for example, they had a poster where they more or less said that Germany should just not export arms or definitely not export arms into, you know, war zones. Um, and, and now, you know, the Greens are pushing for that more strongly than any other party in German politics, right? So, yeah, I mean, it, it might be that a lot of young people have, you know, voted for them, but, you know, are they really getting sort of what they voted for now? So the question, so we talked about the Greens. I also want to talk about something Ghana alluded to earlier on. So we had the Social Democrats, Schultz, with this, you know, big speech, which was a, you know, a firm a firm line um, on, you know, what needs to happen for Germany, even if, you know, reacting to what seems like a probable scenario at the time may not be the scenario now. How has, I guess, uh, how have the Social Democrats, has the rhetoric evolved, Johnny? You said that they, there may be some backsliding or risk that this, you know, policy that was uh, announced might not be implemented. What about um, the Christian Democrats? Um, where are they positioning themselves on this? So all of the above. Do you want to go first? Actually, when Scholz gave this, I think, historic speech, um, this was met with broad consensus in the Bundestag uh, among all the what we call mainstream parties. So not the very left and not the very right uh, of the, the um, spectrum of political parties in Germany. But um, actually, the Christian Democrats, um, they all applauded Um they even one of them even uh, shouted bravo <laughs> and and he, he, yeah, many were kind of really excited um so there was this moment when there was uh, yeah this broad consensus and i had the impression it was um some sort of all hands on deck approach so people realized this is kind of really something special this is an historic moment and we really um all need to make sure um that that, that we are getting this right um and what we see now is that we see uh, first cracks emerging and um, in the social uh, democracy because the truth is also that olaf Scholz, when he gave the speech he did not consult with his party or even his coalition um partners closely before he gave the speech so he made up his mind he uh, i think talked to a number of people, I think a handful of people, and then he gave the speech. And you saw that when you watched the debate in, in Parliament, um, that whereas the CDU, the Christian Democrats, were super happy with everything that Charles said, some of the Greens weren't uh, so happy. And you see now that um, the Green Party and the SPD, they have um, members who come from a, well, who have a different background, um, a pacifist background uh, against, as Marcel just said, against more arms exports, um, not very much in favor of what they often call the militarization of German foreign policy. And so now you see that these people who have been pretty sent for, for some weeks because of the shock and the war are now um, starting to, um, yeah, to, 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 to raise criticism much more openly and to question um, whether this whole approach doesn't go too far. So this is one problem that I think especially Olaf Scholz needs to manage that within his own party, very influential people don't share his overall assessment, um, or at least they don't want to go any further. And I think on the part of the Christian Democrats, um, you saw uh, that basically they realize now that um, a topic was stolen from them. They consider themselves to be the party of the Bundeswehr, the advocate for the Bundeswehr. They always um, talked about the need to spend 2% and they always said, oh, we cannot do this because the Social Democrats are holding us back. And there is some truth to this. The Social Democrats prevented Germany from procuring armed drones eight years ago. They delayed the decision to find a successor solution for uh, the tornado um, a plane that uh, allows us to remain in the nuclear sharing arrangement in NATO. But it was also kind of the Christian Democrats that, um, yeah, that, that were responsible for defense policy, having the, 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 the minister for, for 16 years and, and the chancellor. So the CDU now sees that um, the SPD goes further than they ever dreamt. <laughs> and they feel threatened because the SPD basically stole their topic. And now they... Yeah, they, they try to find their way in opposition, how to, to deal with it, to be constructive, because the SPD is aiming for something that they um, basically support. But yeah, now they find um, ways to, I think, to do party politics and to torpedo the project. Although I have to say they have one fair point, and maybe that's my last point here. But so with the 100 billion Sondervermögen, the special fund, um, there is a problem because as it stands now, um, it is not an add-on to us spending 2%, but um, it's basically a fund that will be used successively over the next few years 
um, to ensure that Germany can reach the NATO 2% tar target, whereas we freeze our ordinary defense budget. And that's what the CDU criticizes heavily. And I think they have every right to do so because it's not a sustainable solution. It means that once this money uh, is used up, uh, we will be left with uh, yeah, the status quo ante, which is, I think, not a very good solution. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think the point that Jana made about the CDU now being in opposition um, is key. I think they're in some ways quite confused because they're not really sure how to handle this. Um, you know, on the one hand, like Jana said, they want to be constructive, but you know, for a long time they hadn't really decided what that would mean. You know, so sometimes they were pushing the government to take a harder line and you know to act more quickly and so forth. But then other times they were also like, well, you know, okay, but maybe they're too far also, right? So. You know, I think oftentimes it might have been quite difficult for voters to really differentiate between what the CDU would want right now and what the Social Democrats would want right now. And I think that in turn then made it easier for the Social Democrats to, to deal with that pressure. And then, of course, you know, like I, like I mentioned before, this Russia problem in German politics is not exclusive to Social Democrats, right? So in the Christian, in the CDU, uh, you also have a bunch of people that have a very rosy view uh, of, of Moscow. And, uh, you know, some of them including people in power, still haven't really changed their opinion. And I think for the Social Democrats, you know, uh, from, from the outside, I almost had the impression that Schultz's speech was so strong that it almost stunned, you know, his own party. Uh, you know, because at that moment in time, you know, the rocket started flying, then you have the speech. It was very difficult to really mobilize against it. But like Jana said, the key is going to be what happens, uh, you know, what happens next, you know, when people either get used to the conflict or the intensity of the conflict is reduced, uh, you know, are you going to see more and more social democrats that are opposed to Schultz's, uh, you know, I guess the, the vision that he outlined back then, at least, are they going to come out, uh, you know, sort of, are they going to come out from hiding, essentially, uh, and mobilize against it? And I think there's a realistic possibility that that could happen. Uh, but I don't know, what share of the party those voices really represent. Because I, I do I do get the impression that a lot of leading social democrats have genuinely changed their views on all this. I, I don't know what your impression is, Yana. Um, yeah, I think especially the, the party leadership, for example, everything that um, uh, Lars Klingbeil um, says. But, um, for example, the party group chair, um, Rolf Mützenich, he is, um, yeah, he, um, he has built his entire... I think worldview on the assumption that one can find, uh, yeah, that one could create a European security order, an inclusive European secure security order with Russia, and his worldview now is in shatters. But um, I, I'm not sure uh, how sustainable that is actually. So I think uh, listening to interviews that he gave recently after the war started, I'm not so sure how much the old status quo ante is considered a thing of the past, um, or how much, yeah remains <laughs> from this connection. Yeah. So zooming in on this status quo ante, so there's this, you know, the speech, the Zeit and Bender, the need to invest in the military. So I want to explore with both of you a little bit about why that was necessary in, uh, in the first place. Um, there's this anecdote that is commonly heard in D.C. when people once, or at least before the war, when people wanted to complain about Germany, you know, not spending enough on its defense, there's this there was this NATO exercise and the Germans came in and didn't even have machine guns. They had to use broomsticks. And <laughs> I, I would say, I wouldn't say that if I had a nickel for every time I heard that I'd be rich, but I like probably would have maybe like half a dollar by now. It's, it's, I've heard it quite a few times. So one about kind of the state of the military before all this started, was it in good shape, bad shape, but I also want to touch on like what in the uh, status quo ante, like conception of the military, like what was, what was the Bundeswehr for? Like the U S military is, there to protect, like project power and be anywhere in the world within 24 hours and ensure the stability of trade, X, Y, Z. Why was there a German military? And yeah, what, what shape was it in? And Marcel, we can start with you there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the sort of like, what is the military good for? I think that has been, you know, I don't know about Diana, but I, a lot of people over the years have asked me exactly that, but they didn't mean it in the sense of, you know, what capabilities exactly do we need, but more like, why do we even have a military in the first place? <laughs> you know, uh, so I think in terms of public debate, that, that was often the level uh, that that had happened yet, um, you know, because Germany has such a hard time debating interests and you know trying to come up with ways that it can use its tools to achieve those interests. At least the public debate around this has been quite unclear and honestly not not all that serious for for quite a long time. 
In terms of the actual military capabilities, um, I'm, I'm not an expert on defense funding, but as far as I understand, there's just a huge gap uh, in investment uh, in the military. So it's not really that Germany doesn't spend much money on uh, the military. It does. Um, but, you know, they, they spend a lot of money on things that are not necessarily on, you know, tanks or ships or, you know, submarines or whatever. Um, but stuff like personnel, for example, sucks a, a lot of money. And even though Germany spends a lot of money, uh, the funding needs would be even greater. And you have a lot of money that is just being wasted, right? So uh, you see a lot of, you know, like one of the sort of common debates in Europe is about duplication, right? So I don't know. I forgot that statistic. Maybe you don't remember, but something about those like 28 battle tanks or something that like the Europeans have and then the Americans have like one, that sort of stuff. So I guess the the, the big picture is that Germany does spend a lot, but it should really have to spend more and it has to spend it in a different way uh, to actually spend it effectively. And then, of course, you know, the last couple of decades, the focus in a way really hasn't been Russia, right? I mean, of course, you know, Germans often talk about, you know, defending the alliance, and both, but when it came to actual deployments abroad, yeah, some of it was, you know, the sort of triple Y in Eastern Europe, but a lot of the focus was on anti-terrorism. And obviously, when you look at those anti-terrorism missions, you know, in Africa, for example, you're going to need stuff that is very different to the kinds of things that you need to deter Russia effectively. Um, yeah, no, over to you there. What's your read on? No, I, I, subs- I can subscribe to everything that um, Asa has just said. Maybe just a few footnotes that can be added. I think the problem started basically in the 90s when in Germany, uh, many people, including back then Chancellor Helmut Kohl, believed that Germany is now uh, surrounded by friends only. And the idea was that there was some sort of peace dividend. Um, and that was when we cut military spending uh, dramatically, because as I said, um, I think a few minutes ago in Germany, the assessment was really kind of, we are done with this, kind of, we are done with wars. Um, we are now entering kind of a, a post-war um, history, um, uh, yeah, post-modern, <laughs> it enters post-modern history, something, um, something like that. And so dividend, uh, we cut defense spending. And then also with the financial crisis, um, in 2007, eight, and the following years, the, um, there were even more cuts. Um, and the cuts all over Europe were um, not made in a um, kind of in a, in a coordinated manner, but every country uh, made uh, its own cuts. Uh, and so we ended up with 27 bonsai armies. Um, the problem for Germany was that at a certain point, um, to, to not uh, be kind of um, a hundred percent ready um, was accepted, um, and one yeah, it was I think um, former defense minister de Maizière who uh, coined a phrase which um, I don't know how to translate into English, but basically it's it's the idea that with eight percent um, yeah uh, operational readiness um, one could live, and then when you have a mission you just um, concentrate on that and and get the equipment from all over the country basically. Um, so. And we started to, to get used to this. And this changed only after 2014, the annexation of Crimea. Um, and in the years that followed, um, we um, kind of decided that this was not sustainable. And um, the, the decision was taken to spend more on defense again uh, over years. And Germany is now spending a lot more um, than 2014. But the problem is not only the money. I mean, the money was a problem and, and continues to be one. But it's also, as Marcel said, the pre um, it's it's basically also this connection between industry, the defense industry, the armed forces, the MOD, uh, that did not that it wasn't a very um, healthy relationship. So procurement decisions were taken, and then um, the, the the projects were delayed. Uh, they cost. Um, they, 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 they were more cost uh, intensive, um, the, what was delivered was not what was promised, so all sorts there, and also I think an overall lack of uh, political clarity and guidance, and that um, brings me to your um, second point, the German army, for I think that was precisely the problem that um, many people, uh, also politicians in Berlin, can't really um, agree on what we need the armed forces for. Of course, we had official documents like, for example, the actually not, not so bad white book in 2016, uh, where we uh, defined interests and tasks, but it was it was never really a priority uh, in Berlin. So, and, and fr- from the top, I mean, uh, former Chancellor Angela Merkel was really not interested in this topic at all. She avoided it at all costs, she did not get personally uh, involved. And so, uh, yeah, there was a lack of political guidance. Um, and when we did uh, participate in military missions, like, for example, in Mali or in Afghanistan, um, 
the story at home was always we do this to be good allies. We do this basically to, um, yeah, to, to show our solidarity with the United States after 9-11 or we do this because we cannot kind of let the French go to Africa alone. But it was never about us. And of course, we're clearly defined and politicians also shied away from doing this. So that was the problem. And I think that is still... For me, actually, this is the biggest challenge when it comes to the Zeit and then and the future ahead of us. It's really, can Germany now define a new, its new strategic culture? Because I think um, there is a huge mistrust when it comes to also uh, the, the missions that we participated in. So thinking about Afghanistan and how it ended, um, I think there is really zero appetite <laughs> to, yeah, to, to, to engage in another mission uh, that we completely focus on territorial defense and NATO and Ukraine. But with Mali, actually, we should debate this um, these days because the two mandates are under reconsideration and need to get uh, approval in parliament. So for me, it's really tight. And then the, the long-term challenge is to define what kind of security and defense actor Germany wants to be in the world, uh, what role it wants to play. Um, and it cannot be about becoming another France or another United Kingdom, it needs to be something that Germany identifies with. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great point that you just made about, you know, just trying to be a good ally. Uh, I think that's totally true. And in a way, I, I think we still don't talk enough about interest. You know, even now, when uh, German politicians or, you know, public figures in general uh, justify Germany providing military aid to Ukraine, it is almost always, at least that's my impression, Jana, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost always in moral terms. Right? Yeah. It's you know, the Ukrainians are suffering and therefore we should help them. And of course, that's true. The Ukrainians are suffering. And I would argue that there's a moral uh, argument to be made that, that we should help them, uh, you know, also because of our you know, history in the region and so forth. But the, the, the bigger argument is that it's in our very own national interest to ensure that Ukraine doesn't lose. And if we can contribute to that, then we should do it. Right. And something that I wonder about as well that, that I worry about going forward is that if you always uh, lead with the moral argument, then I believe that, that's, that support could be more fickle, right? You see that also like in German debate when like the Ukrainian ambassador to Berlin, you know, says something that people don't like, then people go, oh, well, you know, he's not sufficiently grateful. Maybe we should, uh, you know, stop sending them weapons. And of course, that sort of argument totally misses the point because it's not about charity and it's, you know, not, you know not primarily about you know, being nice or whatever uh, to the Ukrainians, but it's it's about our very own interest. And if we don't get that into people's brains, then they might change their mind. Um, but at the same time, and I recognize that this is quite difficult because the German electorate is probably not very receptive of these, you know, interest-based arguments. You probably have to lead with the moral argument to mobilize electoral support in the short term to do the right thing, I guess. So, you know... I can see that it's difficult to balance for the people that are actually in charge and that actually have to make decisions. Makes sense. Um, so I want to end with one final question. Now, the initial plan for this question was, how is Germany to position itself in Europe going forward? I think that's a big question, maybe hard to predict based on all of the complicated factors we have just uh, discussed at length. But I do want to ask, like, if... If um, this second event is going to stick, if we're going to see, you know, a new consensus emerge, uh, emerging, I want to uh, borrow one of kind of the toolkit or the tools from the political risk toolkit. And that's thinking about signposts. What are you looking for as signals that second Venda is sticking or second Venda is not sticking? Are there decisions you're waiting for? Are there uh, speeches? Are there rhetoric? Is it concrete policy steps you're going to be on the lookout for in the coming couple of weeks, in the coming months? I can give you my top three. Um, so first, um, I think thing to watch is uh, what happens to the Sondervermögen, to the special fund, um, because this is now, um, yeah, as I said, a heated debate, uh, because the ambition is to anchor it in our basic law. Um, and uh, the CDU insists um, that a sustainable solution is to be found uh, to make the 2% spending commitment, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a long-term commitment and not only a thing that, that we will be able to reach uh, in the next four years um, and and whether whether a solution is found, um, that allows us uh, to uh, to use this under um, for long-term procurement um, and not uh, yeah long-term procurement decisions and not um, w th that doesn't put put us in a position where we need to spend I don't know 25 billion euros a year uh, which is super difficult to digest and to to swallow 
Um, number two would be how we adjust our relationship with China. Because I think uh, for me, one of the big lessons learned from our dependence, uh, dependency on, on Russia is um, what does this tell us about our uh, macroeconomic interdependencies with China? Because they also have security risks um, and those have not been recognized in Germany. And the third would be how does uh, Germany um, engage itself in NATO? Um, because I think the aim should really be to make Germany uh, the conventional backbone of NATO. Um, I think Germany must play a leading role in further strengthening uh, of NATO, strengthening the credibility of NATO and alliance cohesion. And yeah, if Germany is, is, is doing more on that front, these three things for me are, are crucial. And Marcel, yeah. what are you looking at? Yeah, I get, you know, the question that I've been asking myself over the last couple of months is, um, you know, to what extent are the changes that are happening really happening because there's been a change in Berlin? And to what extent are they just happening as a result of uh, Allied pressure, right? And, you know, it's probably no coincidence that a lot of the things that Germany has done over the last couple of months are things that its allies would have very much wanted it to do. So I guess I think everything that Jana said is correct, and I'm also looking out for all of those. Um one thing that I'm also looking out for, though, is that like at one point, is Germany's foreign policy going to move beyond being purely reactive? You know, like is there any point at which we will do something because we think it's in our interest to do it and we don't need to be pushed to do it, you know, for weeks or months or whatever. But we just do it because it's the right thing to do for us. And so far, I'm not super convinced. Um, so that's that's what I'm on, on the lookout for. And on that optimistic note, I um, wanted to thank both of you sincerely for joining today. Um, I said at the very beginning of this that uh, my goal with this whole series is to learn, and I have learned a lot through my discussion with you. So uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, to wrap it up, I'm going to give the floor back to FPRI, uh, to Natalia, who's hosting, and I believe she has some closing remarks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, and thanks again to our guests, Yana and Marcel, for this thought-provoking conversation and to all of our listeners for participating. As a reminder, if you missed any part of the discussion, the recording will be available shortly. Um, and to explore more from FPRI's research, podcasts, and upcoming events, be sure to visit us on www.fpri.org. Thanks, and until next time.